Good morning. Welcome to uh, SACPA. SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the land of the Blackfoot people and Métis nations of Alberta, Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA is very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. Today, we're very, very happy and, and, and would like to welcome Samantha Murr, Rural Medicine President for the Alberta Medical Association. Samantha Murr is a family physician in Pinchy Creek, where she and her colleagues are true generalists and now endangered species in medicine. Together, they run the clinic, hospital, emergency room, and surgical obstetrics. Trickle, sorry, I struggle with that word, obstetrical services for the surrounding area. All while training and constant complement of six medical students slash residents. What started as a fight to maintain the broad services her group is proud to deliver has led to multiple regional and provincial advocacy roles. Samantha is vice president of Pincher Creek's Attraction and Retention Committee, advises government on rural sustainability through various channels, and is the current president of the section of rural medicine for the Alberta Medical Association. Thank you so much for joining us today at SACPA, and we look forward to your talk. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to start by saying that uh, just before we went live, I said that I might not have any of those roles after this talk is done. <laughs> Uh, I, I do have a confession. I am totally unprepared for this talk. This is the most unprepared I have ever felt for a presentation. Um, normally, I spend hours researching, talking to experts, making sure that I have the most up-to-date uh, evidence and that I'm anticipating questions and have data ready to you know, spout when I'm answering them. I didn't do any of that this time. I am post-call. I have slept for three hours, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to string together words to make coherent sentences. But I don't need any of that because I've been doing this advocacy for two years, and I'm not here to push an argument or provide evidence towards some sort of intellectual outcome, this is a request for help, really. The reason that I'm here is to say that we are struggling in rural. Um, if you didn't notice from the title of the talk, the trajectory we are on is not a good one. And despite bringing those kind of polished presentations to various tables for two years, um, been unable really to make a difference, it feels like. So I'm very grateful for the chance to, to talk to you guys and also to hear your questions and hopefully get a sense of the understanding that uh, the rural audience and regional audience has of the current problems we're facing. I really value these discussions because I think it's the only way to bring the public along. Um, it's easy to feel like everybody shares the, the burden that we are feeling. Um, but when I talk with my patients, I, I do get a very mixed response there. Some people have no idea that we've lost, you know, almost half of our own doctors since I've started here in Pincher Creek. Um, you know, I, I get that you guys see the other side of it, the long wait times, you know, the phones that are busy constantly, uh, feeling like you're rushed or like your doctor might be distracted. Uh, or is pulled away in various directions. And that's because, like the introduction, we are in every place at once in rural. And that's what makes rural physicians special. And that's why it's so important that people understand the value of having physicians as part of the medical team in a rural community. I think... There's a lot that I want to say. Um, I'm gonna open up questions early too, so please do put your responses 
into the chat so that, yeah, so I can get started answering those uh, when the time comes, but I uh, don't feel like you have to wait till the 30 minute mark. I think I'm going to start with with telling my story because I think that resonates more with people than evidence and facts. And clearly that has been the case. It's the only thing that has worked. So I am here as the section of rural medicine president in my third year of practice. It was a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, I snowballed from just speaking up when I saw the devastation that was about to befall my own community. Like I said, we started with 11 physicians um, and we're down to six currently and including one surgeon who, you know, God forbid he gets sick or, or uh, you know, is, is burnt out and, and it's just done because that is the end of a lot of our surgical programs, our ability to deliver babies safely here and in the surrounding communities. And there are plenty of rural communities across the province that are in the same position where the fate of their hospital, which is often linked to the fate of their community, because that is a big driver of both economy and um, and really relocation recruitment for more than just healthcare providers. People want to be able to access care uh, quickly and equitably, and they should be able to enroll. And that's not the case right now, and it's going to get worse. And so when you have the fate of those services resting on a few individuals, you're in a precarious position. But what I've learned is that people don't understand the magnitude of the problem until it happens to them, until you start to lose the services. Um, and, and what I'm asking of you today is to, is to open your eyes a bit, to talk to your doctor, um, if you do have to go in, to pay attention to the news, and to really consider what your life would be like if you had to drive an hour or more for care every time you needed it, because that's the reality we are facing. So recognizing that with some of the changes that came out in early uh, 2020 by this government, uh, that they were going to affect rural disproportionately, I started speaking up. I spoke to our mayor, spoke to our council, um, I had the, the good fortune to have him invite me to um, the Southwest Mayors and Reeves, where I got to talk to leaders of other communities, and nobody really understood the impact that was, that was coming. So essentially, my goal was to rally the community because I was worried for my own community. We had a town hall, we wrote, or people understood, people asked hard questions, like I hope you do today. Um, you know, they they heard one message from government and another from, from us, and it's normal to feel confused when that happens, right? And so because we're their physicians and their neighbors in rural, or um, friends even, they felt comfortable asking us questions that they might not have otherwise. Uh, it was a good discussion, and I think at the end of that, we had a town that felt like it was behind us. And I don't know how much that you guys know of Pincher Creek um, and the role that we had in um, most of 2020, I think, standing, trying to stand up to government um, and how close we were to withdrawing services last year, but that all came from community. It came from people understanding the problem and rallying behind their health care because it mattered to them. And that's what I'm asking you to do now, even though we're all tired from this pandemic and all the stresses that that has brought. So from that town hall, we had uh, 400, I think, letters that we, we brought to a meeting with Minister Shandro, um, former Minister Shandro, I should say. Uh, so... It was our mayor, a town council, and our town councillor, and myself, and a, another physician. We brought them, thinking, you know, this is a physical manifestation of the the anger of our community, right, and and the desperation to keep services, and we felt very blown off. Um, it was clear that they didn't understand the problem. They were pulled in multiple directions, and we weren't a priority. So we made more noise. We had a rally. Uh, we 
started reaching out or I started reaching out to physicians in other corners of the province and found that this was a similar sentiment all over. And so if you were paying attention to the news last year at all, there was a, um, a withdrawal of services or a planned withdrawal of services from about 44 different communities. I'm going to preface this by saying I, if I can't remember numbers or, or data or any of that, I'm happy to, to bring it up. Or if I can't answer questions, I'm happy to, to touch base with people after the fact and get you the actual numbers. But I will consider it a miracle if I can remember <laughs> where I was at any of these times right now. So um, 44 communities were going to be impacted by potential loss of hospital services. And that was enough. In fact, I think that was the only thing that has ever gotten government's attention. So suddenly MLAs cared. Uh, they were hearing from angry constituents. They re recognized that their jobs depend on healthcare. Well, they, their jobs depend on their constituents being happy with them. And people that fear they're going to lose healthcare are not happy, generally. And so they were able to influence from within the party a shift in priorities, a shift in policy, and we were able to achieve some rollbacks that made it, you know, economically viable at least to continue the services that we were providing. Um, because with the changes that they had proposed, it actually ended up costing money to do things like deliver babies. Uh, so we were, would be working at a loss for most of the hospital work that we did, um, which makes no sense and, and just prove the point that rural is often under, misunderstood. So going back to what has worked, you, it is really the public caring that has made a difference. It is very clear that showing up to all these tables with evidence or or providing advice um, to the minister himself, uh, who did eventually come around, um, didn't actually influence policy in the way that we hoped, right? And I think we're seeing that again with COVID. There's lots of differences in the way that Alberta has approached things and lots of uh, Lots of physicians speaking up, teachers, you know, public health officials um, from other parts of Canada or the world speaking out against what we're doing and providing evidence, and we don't seem to be following a lot of it. And that really, to me, uh, was the point at which I realized that I need to stop being carefully nonpartisan and ask you to make a difference by how you vote how you vote and, and how you talk to your MLA and how you talk to each other, how you talk to your, your physicians and the nurses or other allied health professionals in your community, because we're all struggling. And um, I think nothing really shows it better than, than showing you the words of my fellow colleagues, which I put together in a word cloud, if you don't mind changing the slide. Yeah, I can't see it myself here, but the name of this talk was not a coincidence. It was, uh, this is a cry for help really, because I feel like rural is uh, close to arrest, right? And a code blue is is what you call when, when you need a team to come and help all hands on deck to resuscitate somebody who is dying. And that's really how it feels for rural medicine right now. Um, in the words of my colleagues, you know, we're demoralized. And this is across the province. Um, represent about 700, 800 physicians that are providing care to about 20% of the population at about six, six or seven percent of the health budget. Um, demoralized, exhausted. They feel like rural medicine is dying. They have already made the decision to flee Alberta in their words. Um, they're embarrassed for their province. They've had to lay off staff. They're not feeling like patients get it. Um, they feel guilty that 
they want to quit or want to leave their patients when they know that there's nobody coming to take their position. People are just kind of putting their head down and putting one foot in front of another to make sure that you guys get the care that you deserve. Um, and I don't think many of us feel like we're doing a good job of it right now. We're stretched very thin. And so I don't have the time and energy to put together a presentation because I spend so much of my time and energy um, caring about and caring for you guys over two years now. And so what I'm asking for is that you guys uh, recognize that what you need to do is care for yourself and speak up for yourself because our voices clearly don't matter, but yours does. Um, I'm happy to uh, start taking questions. Um, I guess the actually there's a couple of other things I'd like to to touch on that may not come up in questions. And so I'll just say that um, in this fight with government, and it really was a fight last year um, and felt like it. So we felt like we were fighting for our lives then. and and we are doing so in a different way now. but but the former minister, Tyler Shandro, did, come around. He visited our site. He spent hours with us touring, understanding what it is we do here and extended a, a sort of olive branch, right? We were able to stop what had been uh, just attacks back and forth in the press or, you know, he said, she said stuff, uh, which is what nobody wants, but what we felt like we had to do, always scream to be heard. Um, and, and start getting down to the whole point, which is working together to keep you guys healthy. And I, I really did feel like he was starting to get it. And I would be the first to admit my surprise at, at actually enjoying time spent with the former Minister of Health, Tyler Shandro, after everything that happened. But I did, because it was clear that he was starting to understand and, and think to how things could be different. Um, and we were able to meet regularly and discuss rural issues. And I felt like maybe some ground was being made. And I have to wonder if that was part of the decision to, to change ministers at this point in time, because I can tell you that the, the leader of this party has never come to visit, never been available to talk, won't tour ICUs at the request of the head of emergency medicine for the AMA, hasn't listened any time we've reached out and um you know what what has changed is that we have been meeting regularly with minister shandro and have not heard at all from minister copping somebody brand new doesn't understand presumably the the health portfolio he is now in charge of in a pandemic and it feels like yet another way to to keep going in the direction we were rather than making it better. And so when I say that, is this the plan, right? Is this government's plan, do not resuscitate? It feels like it because two years ago or nearly two years ago, the, um, the announcement for the Ernst & Young review, so a review of Alberta Health Services, uh, which was delayed over and over again because of the pandemic, but did eventually come out saying, you know, we would recommend closure of some rural hospitals. We would recommend that many others um, decrease their services. They only have uh, emergency during the day. And we don't think that rural doctors are safe to deliver babies unless they deliver an arbitrary number of 200 a year. Um, which will definitely result in loss of services for so many women. And again, not understanding rural, nobody wants to drive in the middle of winter in labor for an hour and a half or whatever it takes to get to a center that they deem capable, um, even though we've been doing it for years. Speaking from that lens of this was coming, it was asked for, this was the report, and then the lack of help over and over again, and the lack of desire to understand, moving the minister that did start to understand, um, 
and not hearing from the new one, it feels like maybe the point is just to drive us away. And with us, without us, there can't be hospitals, right? There can't be the, there's many really capable, really qualified health professionals that can do most of the work, but they can't do the surgeries, right? They can't, they can't do the, the intubations um, with, the, with the training that we have in our anesthetists or the epidurals for your labor. They can't run the codes that might bring you back or your loved one back from a heart attack. And certainly you can't keep a hospital with inpatients and run an emergency department. And so when they said that they wouldn't close rural hospitals, I think that was quite intentional. But the point is now that they are going to close on their own because I see people leaving left and right and the people that are left are exhausted as you see from their own words. Um, I guess, again, can't say it enough. We just want your help in keeping this as a priority because we feel like you deserve care close to home. And we know the outcomes when you don't have it. And so with that, thank you for listening to my very rambled plea for help and happy to answer some questions. Okay, thank you so much. I've just put up your last slide here uh, about the public health guarantee. Um, ah, yes. That has. That was, I'm just going to say a, a word about that. That was um, the picture on the right was from the rally here. It was my, my favorite sign. Uh, somebody just put it in the back of their truck and drove around in our socially distanced rally um, in June of last year. Okay. Um, and and it has your questions, comments with your email address there. Um, but we have actually quite a few questions in the queue, so I'll get right started right away. Um, our first question comes from Ian Hurdle. 50 years ago, there was only mild interest in rural medicine. 30 years ago, South Af Africans came. In the last 25 years, as Alberta graduates started to become adequate, there was keen competition to be rural. A lot of hard work made this happen. And now, comments, please. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, such a great comment, Ian. I have a lot to say about it, but what I think is most important to say is that we have been a practice in Pincher Creek of nothing but Canadian trained, actually Alberta trained grads for two, almost two decades in terms of the new physicians um, arriving. And we recruit from our students and our residents. They come to the site. Actually, that's how I'm here, right? I actually didn't even mean to be here. I came and I saw the, I was off to BC to do emergency. Um, I have never been at a place that I respected as much as I do Pincher Creek. And I, and it really allowed me to see the breadth of, of medicine that uh, being a rural generalist can give you, right? Um, I see that happening over and over again, right? When I started, it was, it was with a few other early on um, new grads or brand new grads and they're all gone or leaving. Um, the next one's leaving October 20th. And so it's just, it's just me left. And we've had people that we have trained as, a, as medical students and that then came back as residents. They spent you know a year and a half with us and they came back as a locum after that. And now they work down the road in BC. And, and the plan was always to stay here people come here and they love it and we like half the practice is from the rural Alberta South uh, residency program I believe and so they come they love it they stay except for now they don't and and when I was doing this work in the beginning um, through the grassroots side of things before I ended up here somehow um, <laughs> with my big mouth um, 
they, I did poll or I, I got in touch with the residency programs and, and they had done a poll of their current um, R1s and R2s since the two-year program. And the results were devastating. It was normally, um, I think about 80% stay in, now don't quote me on these numbers, 80% uh, stay in Alberta and it was flipped on its head. And the medical students were even worse. It was, it was over 90% uh, were planning to leave Alberta. Spending the money to train these people to go elsewhere because there's no certainty. We still don't have an agreement since February, 2020. There's still a threat of, of PRAC ID changes. And for those that aren't familiar, it's basically uh, what you need to be able to practice. And the concern is that a government has it hanging over uh, trainees' heads that they can decide where you can go. They can limit where you will be allowed to work after you train in Alberta. Um, and that's obviously not going to be a desirable place to live. Or to or to buy into, right? And so we're seeing a lot of that too. We people, my colleagues depend on other people buying into practices in order to have a succession plan, and and that's not happening. Nobody wants to invest um, in Alberta right now. I think that's actually quite widespread, not just medicine, but so too much uncertainty. So it's unfortunate because we are highly sought after graduates. Um, I knew coming, I did my training in BC uh, for medical school, and I was definitely proud to come home to Alberta to, to be a rural resident and really appreciated my training and came out to hit the ground running doing all the things I do now. There's not a lot of places you can do that. Okay, our next question comes from Mark Goodall. How does the situation compare to other areas of Alberta, as well as the rest of the country? What is the average physician to population ratio? Ooh, um, I told you I can't remember numbers right now. <laughs> no, I can get back to you on the numbers, but I know it's, uh, it's not good for rural, right, in particular. And that's, that's pretty widespread. We know that, um, and I did sort of allude to that earlier, that there's a very small amount of us looking after um, about a fifth of the population. And I think, um, and it, we feel it, right? We feel it more than anything. And I think that's what I'm trying to, to get across is that the, the demand is so high. There's no accepting family physician in Southern Alberta right now. We get calls from all over the province. Uh, we get calls from Calgary asking if we're accepting um, in Pincher Creek, which for the record is two hours away um, in, in the Southwest corner. Um, it's, it's insane. And we, so we see people leaving and nobody's coming and that problem is only going to get worse, right? That divide that already existed with, uh, low, you know, physician to um, population ratio in rural in particular. I can't tell you the stats for um, for urban or if we even know that. That's been part of the issue, actually, right? People keep demanding the numbers. The government demands the numbers. And the numbers don't tell the story because you can hold your license in Alberta and be elsewhere. And so when you're looking at CPSA numbers, so our college, for registrations um, to, to tell the story, it's not gonna be accurate because I could be practicing in BC and still have my license here. And, and we're seeing lots of that, right? So we're seeing lots of people testing waters elsewhere and just waiting to see if it gets better here um, to know if they're gonna stay or if they're gonna go to their, the place that they've been working in part-time in another province. And also they've been recruiting us, like they've been, other provinces have been uh, very blatantly putting ads out, just saying like, basically, is your government getting you down? Then come over here. We've got a great deal for you. And also we'll respect you. <laughs> and in turn, just to, just to follow up on that question, in turn, is Alberta recruiting? <laughs> well, we're trying. Yeah, I think that's the, what could we really say to entice somebody to come here right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, unless, unless you're like a, a masochist, I guess. 
Okay, our next question comes from Laura Schultz. Is there any indication for a better working relationship with the new Minister of Health, Health uh, Minister Cops? Yeah, um, I, you know, initial feeling from uh, AMA leadership has been that he's been willing to talk um, and that he seems interested in moving forward. Like I said, I haven't heard anything from him after we had been regularly meeting with Minister Shandro on rural specific issues and um, have thought about reaching out and then realized, you know, if if they care, they will do it, right? If If this matters to them, they're going to reach out and otherwise this might be a waste of time. And, and I think that's part of it, right? They're eager to look good. Um, there's an election coming. They want to deal with doctors, but what evidence is there that they have been doing the work to get there, right? Uh, so we can't just, yeah, sign our names to a paper and hope that it's going to be better without actually seeing any demonstrable change in the relationship. So I, you know, we are talking more or had been um, in Rule's case, but I think the talk is cheap, right? I want to see some action. Okay, our next question comes from Mark Goodall. If as the U U UPC, sorry, if as the U UPC claims that the doctors are so overpaid in Alberta, why isn't this attracting doctors from elsewhere? That's a great question and one we've been asking for two years. Uh, like, I mean, for starters, money isn't everything. Um, it's become less and less of a priority for for people. I think there's when there's no job satisfaction when you're treated with such disrespect and and called like greedy and overpaid and things like that publicly. Um, when your voice isn't heard on your own area of expertise, when you see government making policy that is hurting your patients when you don't feel like you may be able to do or practice how you want, where you want. Um, and have any sense of security. I don't think money matters at all. And I think you'll notice looking back through the last couple of years of news, there's not any talk about money from the AMA side of things or the doctor side of things or hardly, right? I mean, what we did last year was ne was necessary and it was around pay because you're not going to be able to recruit a soul if you cut like, to hospital work and stuff, if you make it disadvantageous to do so. Like why take on the crazy hours that we do? Like we rural docs work probably minimum 65 hours a week, but more up to 120 or something times <laughs> like it's or on call 24 seven, right? Um, it's not something that you're going to do if you're not paid to do it. It's certainly not something you're going to do if you are losing money while, while providing that care out of, out of clinic. Um, and so that, that part mattered, but in terms of money, it's really just been about, can people even keep their offices open? Can they keep their staff employed? Like that's where we're at. When we started this before COVID, um, you know, they, they used things like the McKinnon report, which was, uh, I don't know how to put this in any non-blunt way, but totally bogus. Like they, use, they didn't compare the right things. They cherry picked the data used. They didn't take into consideration that Alberta is in general well paid compared to other provinces for other things. Um, and therefore you're paying your employees more. So the numbers they use were way inflated. It wasn't that much of a difference, but there there was a little bit of an Alberta advantage. Um, and that's, you know, spans more than just medicine. Uh, but without that, and now all the rest, it's not a desirable place to work at all. And I think um, where we're at is that, you know, with the pandemic, we've been so unsupported compared to other provinces with things like virtual medicine, 
where the work we do virtually to try to keep patients safe and out of the clinic and not congregated together um, actually is done at, you know, kind of at least 30% less than inpatient or in-person care. Um, and that's led to some people not being able to keep their clinics open because they actually can't pay the staff to do it. And like, and when you start decreasing staff, you start decreasing quality of care too, because we rely on them a lot for, for efficiency and flow. And it's, it's a big problem. Um, and it's not one that's going to be solved with money other than to say that, that government is actually going to have to invest more now if they want to attract people to come, which is the exact opposite of what they intended, I think, in the first place. Um, and if they want to rebuild the care that we, the care deficit that, or sorry, the primary care to tackle the care deficit that we're seeing in COVID, it's a whole other topic, but the demand is high, people are sicker, they're not getting their surgeries, there's a backlog for everything, and, and people have been not uh, visiting their physician for like a year and a half and come in really sick. And so we actually need to invest more. And I'm sure when the pandemic is done, they're going to be talking about cutting to balance the budget. But at what cost, right? Okay, our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. What actions can an individual take to make a change? Yeah, I kind of I tried to allude to to some of the things that I've seen work. I think bringing it up is the the first thing, right? It's like actually just having the conversations because it feels like that's kind of died down. You get the odd patient that asks like, "How are you doing?" <laughs> you know, um, when after I ask them, and and you know we end up having a really good conversation. And you know I I live in a very conservative part of the province. Um, where lots of people voted UCP and and regret that for what they've seen happen, uh, not just to health healthcare but other um, other sectors for sure. Education, childcare um, are two very big ones. I like I don't like I don't blame any way, one for the way they voted and like I said I've been trying to be very nonpartisan um because of my roles right but it comes a time where I think and it's hurting Albertans that it's not okay to to be careful like that anymore if that's going to affect negotiations or if it's going to affect the relationship then there's not one there anyway and so um I think having those difficult conversations that feel kind of uh like people are like in, like kind of embarrassed or like guilty, right? They're like, oh, well, doc, like I voted easy. <laughs> it's like, it's okay, just don't do it again. That's where, right? That's where I'm at at this point, unless they show that they're actually working with all of these sectors instead of cutting them. Because these are the sectors that hold up Albertans, right? They keep us healthy, they keep us prosperous, they keep people actually able to contribute to the economy. And if you just focus on the economy, you're gonna lose the rest, right? And it's gonna cost more in the end. So having the conversations, being intentional with your vote, um, and and I think, you know, pressuring your MLAs because it has worked before. Um, and again, like I said, we, so, or maybe I didn't say, but I had lots of meetings with our local MLA in the beginning, it was very sympathetic. Um, took time to understand the problems, got us hooked up with Minister Shandro for that meeting where we brought the letters and were promptly ignored and, and then kind of disappeared, right? Like wasn't when, when we were having our rally to save our healthcare locally, um, Premier Kenny was, was touring the, the riding with our MLA. That was not unintentional uh, going around for photo ops. And we invited them both, of course, but uh, no word back. Um, I think people just need to be held accountable. And that's, you know, it's easy to feel like your voice doesn't matter when it's just one person, but it it matters. It mattered very much in the beginning. And I think the tendency now is to try to tune it out and make people tired so that they stop trying, they stop calling, they stop sending letters, they stop writing in the paper. Um, 
because it seems futile, but it's not. They are our elected officials and they're, it's their job to listen to us. And so please keep speaking. And then also just like say nice things to healthcare professionals <laughs> and each other. But it's just, I feel like kindness is, is gone away because people are so stressed and so tired. Um, we do get a lot of rude patients to our staff and to us. And, um, and so just understanding maybe how exhausted and being asking, just ask your local doc how you can help too. Okay, our next question comes from Ian Hurl. As an ex-rural GP in Newfoundland, my perspective is personal. My family has lost family doctors to early retirement. My two physician children, two have been recruited to BC and the third already has a BC license. Comment. Yep. <laughs> Nailed it. Like that's what's happening. That's and for all the reasons in the word cloud, right? It's like this is the state of our healthcare professionals. And it's not just us, right? Nurses too. Um, and anybody with a union, which physicians do not have a union for the record. But um I, I think it's it's unavoidable in the short term, but we got to try to prevent loss by acting now. I think, I do think a lot of people are waiting to see what happens in the next election. And if we don't put healthcare front and center in the conversations leading up to that, there's not going to be any action. Um, I, I think that they still feel quite safe in in rural places in particular. And, you know, I think the the less people understand and have the conversation and know what's happening and 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 hear those stories, Ian, those personal stories of like, yeah, my doctor left or my, you know, my two physician um children left the province already and, you know, and I have family members who can't get care. Like that stuff matters because it is starting to have a personal impact. And my worry has always been that if we don't act ahead of time, you know, it people won't people won't care until it's too late because we know back from not we that's so I'm very new to practice. Uh, my colleagues tell me that things were rough after the Klein years, and that things are going to be so much harder this time around. And it took ten years to rebuild what was broken then. And so I really worried about how we are going to how we are possibly going to rebuild after this. And and for for you guys and for me, rural is going to be even harder. It's so difficult to recruit and retain rural health professionals at the best of times because of how hard it is, because of the, you know, the moral sort or not moral, the the like deep emotional toll it takes to to watch your like friends um get sick and die like right to, to be there are co-workers there are staff there are neighbors and and like even now right watching them with covid is is terrible there's so many sick people we're watching so much morbidity and mortality not watching we are trying to <laughs> prevent it but uh involved in it right um and I know this is not on topic now, but I would like to also say, please stop protesting. <laughs> if anybody on this call has been to a protest, please just don't. That is probably the most demoralizing thing to see. Um, anything healthcare. But that's the state we're in, right? And part of it is because there's so much uh, mixed messages, miscommunication, that people are angry and confused. And I don't blame them, right? But But if people can think about how their actions make the very few of us left um, feel it's, you know, it might tip somebody over the edge. And I think that was captured in the word cloud too. It's like the protests were the last straw was what from one position. Um, I don't have all the answers. I just know that we need to be actually sitting down and working towards a solution with government because we, neither of us can do this alone. Um, in any sort of way that's going to be um, okay for for Albertans. Okay, 
Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. How do you think the COVID pandemic has affected the way Jason Kenney and his Alberta government deal with doctors, nurses, and healthcare in general? Well, I thought that maybe it would slow them down, but that does not seem to be the case. Like I, you know, in the beginning, the assumption was that we would we just pause things, right? It was like, oh, okay, there's something big we need to focus on here and we probably need each other for it. So that's why it was so um, so surprising and and really quite devastating to be starting into this really prolonged pandemic without an agreement and with government deciding to move forward with all of the changes they had proposed anyway. Um, so it didn't really seem to slow them down in the beginning. I, I know you're probably speaking to more of the political side of things, and there's lots of considerations there that um, you know, using using it to buy time, using it to uh, appeal to to the base in various ways around you know masking or exemptions and um, you know vaccine misinformation and all of that sort of thing. I that's where that's why I feel like I can't be nonpartisan right now is because our our public health policy, our healthcare policy in general is not not nonpartisan and it should be. Like it, it feels like there's a lot of a push to private um, sector medicine, right? And I think, I think the assumption is is that we are replaceable, and I guess that's what I'm trying to tell you guys is that, at least in, you know, or not at least, definitely in rural we are not, and like I said in the in the intro, we're quite an endangered species, and and Ian had alluded to the training that goes into some somebody like me and my colleagues who do everything. Like you can't just plop in another doctor to do this. Um, and, and so they're not coming, <laughs> right? And if we lose them, it's gonna be devastating. And I don't see any shift in policy towards actually keeping physicians here. So I, I don't know that it's slowed, slowed them down or changed gears too much if the the plan always was to just try to cut us out um, and move towards privatization, which is what it feels like. Okay. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. Can you comment on some of the initiative? Uh, can you comment on some of the initiative measures rural hospitals have taken to strengthen health and well-being of Albertans? For example, surgeries for residents outside of Pincher Creek. Um, surgeries for residents outside of Pincher Creek. I think, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, you mean the fact that we um, actually help the surrounding communities as well. Um, I don't know if you can clarify that, but it's, yeah, we made that argument to the minister as well, uh, our former minister. We, I don't think, I don't think people understand what we do or what we are capable of doing. And so that was one of the benefits of having come out is to be able to show them like we actually we have visiting orthopedic surgeons and general surgeons and dentists and now uh, gynecol um, like OBGYN. Um, we have people come out and bring their patients from Lethbridge, for instance, and they can get their surgery here a lot faster and, and certainly with scopes. So things like colonoscopies, sometimes the wait list is up to like two years in other places. And, you know, if, if we need one done, we do it at the next available day um, locally for an emergency. But even those planned ones, we can take the burden off of sites like Lethbridge um, or Medicine Hat or, you know, Red Deer by taking those sur some of those surgeries to rural sites. And now we can't do everything, obviously, but but it helps, right? It reduces wait times. I mean, currently we are also um, hamstrung by the, the COVID uh, cancellation or postponing of surgeries because they're not allowed to come and operate here either. Um, and because people are just pulled to ICU, right? And they need all the space and all the hands that they can get. 
Um, but even then, we we are taking patients that aren't ours, that don't live rural, <laughs> um, or live in another rural community, could be hours away to our site to offload uh, Lethbridge Hospital and other places like Chinook Regional Hospital and. Rural sites are doing that all over the place. That's part of how we've increased capacity for for more ICU beds um, over and over and over again is just by pulling other hospitalized patients to rural communities. And so we do we do do our part to try to help everyone around us too. And I did say mention before that we do provide obstetrical services to surrounding communities that don't or no longer actually have the ability to do C-sections um, or don't have the coverage, then, then we take over care of those pregnant patients uh, towards the end and so that they can deliver here safely rather than needing to drive all the way to Lethbridge, for instance, um, or see a specialist. And again, that has downstream effects for the specialist not having to um, care for yet another patient, right? And we keep moms as close to home as possible. So there's lots of benefits I can, that's the whole, things that when I was sitting down to try to make a presentation here, uh, I couldn't even fathom how I was going to put it all together in a half an hour. So please do email me uh, questions after the fact too, if you have more. Okay, we have quite a few questions in the queue. We've got about 10 minutes uh, left. Um, maybe we'll just make it a little tighter go a little faster so we can get through all our questions. Mm. <laughs> I'll try yeah. my best. Um, Ian Hurdle, Alberta physicians are less than enamored with Babylon with the telemedicine program being pushed by AHS and TELUS. TELUS also refuses to abide by the privacy health information guidelines. Any comments, please? If I comment on that one, I feel like I'm going to get assassinated by TELUS. So. I'll just leave that one be and say I, I am not okay with the whole way that they are approaching things. It is corporate corporate medicine um, for profit, and the job done is not okay. It actually just puts more more work on the family physicians. People, it's people who don't have access to the patient chart. Um, it's essentially a walk, virtual walk in that then just says, let's order all of these things, let's send you all these places, and then in the end, you just need to go back to your family doctor who's sitting there wondering, why were all these things done and you know, duplicated? Because we've done them before, but they don't know you, right? Or they, they actually harmed you in the sense that they don't even know your medical conditions or your medications, and then now they're left dealing with the, with the mess of that, and the system has been billed multiple times for multiple things. It's not a cost saver at all. It is uh, a cost or a profit generator for a corporation. Okay, our next question comes from Carol. I may be thinking of this question in relationship or in, in relation to hospital doctors who work on rotation. This may illustrate my ignorance on the topic, but is there a place for family docs and surgeons to become salaried public service employees with caseloads instead of private sector employees who bill for tasks? Um, well, that is a, that's a whole can of worms. There are payment arrangements that are like that. Um, and, and the goal is kind of to switch to a model that it's not just entirely service-based and actually Pincher Creek is is on a, a blended capitation model that answers I think a little bit of your question um, but will take way too much time to to explain here and I've been told to keep it short so um, what I'll say is that they, there are places like that a little pockets of it across the province and definitely models in other places but the, they each have their pros and cons um, you you might sacrifice uh, volume, right, in, in places that actually do need volume and where volume doesn't um, come at the expense of quality uh, and things like that, but happy to discuss by email as well. Okay, our next question comes from Colleen Quintel. What is the biggest issue preventing the doctors and the province from signing a contract? 
not agreeing on the basis of uh, like any sort of, how do I put this? So I guess the, probably the easiest way to, to put it is that the government has never really moved much from their original position. Um, we did have a chance at a tentative agreement, which was very clear voted down and by clearly voted down I mean it might not seem like it it was 53 percent against uh, most agreements are are 90 or above percent agreement um, it's never happened before that it's voted down and the reasons are because they haven't taken into consideration the things that we need right the security and not being left with all of the the risk in the system without much say in it so the biggest thing I would say is that physicians don't want to sign something where they don't feel like they're going to have a say in any of the healthcare decisions made. It comes down to that more, probably more than anything money-based. Um, although certainly we also are keenly aware that anything that happens to us is would be precedent setting for other, for uh, like the unions as well, right? And and nobody government is just looking to cut right now and and as long as we have a, a place or a say in how that's done I think we can manage with it but right now and and from what they've done when we haven't had an agreement um, they're not willing to hear it right and and what we want to do is prevent cutting places that are going to hurt patient care uh, so it seems like a no-brainer but it is unfortunately just it's been a struggle getting them to come around to that okay our next question comes from laurie schultz just a comment actually rather than a question recently in my doctor's office i overheard a receptionist tell somebody seeking an appointment that no doctors in the clinic were accepting new patients and advised them to call clinics in okie dokes Like I said, all of Southern Alberta, um, I mean, it can change day to day, but the, the, what I've heard is that nobody's accepting and which is why like we're getting calls from all over the place too. And I'm still looking after patients uh, that have moved to places like Lethbridge and Calgary because they can't find family doctors there either. Um, it's, it's a huge mess. And I think that's the whole point is that people are starting to see the, the signs. Um, but when we see the signs that badly across the province, it's, you can bet rural is hurting in a way that they, you know, that is quite critical. Um, cause we always, we always have harder, a harder time recruiting and retaining. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kurt Peterson, Jason Kenney and his government is basically a dumpster fire. Uh, do you see any light in the end of the tunnel before 2023? And the light, I guess he means by light, not the light from the dumpster fire. Oh, shoot. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. Like nothing, nothing has given me a lot of hope that, that he personally is going to change. Right. Um, and and part of that is because he's never personally cared or showed that, um, never had a conversation, never gone out and said anything but platitudes, you know, sort of, we appreciate you while the actions say, you know, very loudly otherwise. Um, I think the light for me has been how strong and, and widespread the opposition to some of these things have been. I think nobody is, like I was not involved politically at all before any of this. Um, you know, I, I vote and I try, you know, I look at people's <laughs> platforms and I try to vote in a way that, that aligns with my values, but I, I don't keep up with it. But there are so many people paying attention so many people building connections, um, you know, like the Protect Our Province group is 
incredible. And if you haven't seen that, please go look at their YouTube channel after because they, in the, the sort of void that was the public health announcements, um, when things were starting to really get bad in, in wave four, a group of concerned Albertans got together, physicians, nurses, teachers, communications experts, et cetera, people with lived experience got together, created a group to, to be the voice that updates Albertans to give the, the information real time and answer questions like I'm doing right here. Um, and that's the kind of thing that does give me hope and, and that I'm very proud of my colleagues and fellow Albertans for. And so I think if everybody stays this engaged, there is, there's hope, there's light. Um, Leona, I'm sorry, uh, I seem to have skipped your question, but it seems like this is an excellent question to actually end the session on. Um, so Leona Jacobs, besides lamenting the obvious, doctors are leaving, we're short of doctors. What are the concrete asks that we, the public, need to lobby for to help improve this situation. And then in brackets, she says, thinking of letters here. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, so part of it is when things are announced to, to demand some details of, of what that is. Like there's often these sort of like ambiguous, oh, we're putting money into this. It's like, well, what are you, get, what are you actually doing? How is it gonna help? Like asking, government to explain what what it is they are achieving with some of these initiatives that seem like they're just like, oh, look, we're investing in, in rural health care. Um, to ask specifically that there are physicians at various governance tables or other health care professionals or even somebody with a background in health care, that would be lovely because most of the time we're dealing with lawyers and accountants. And so it's no no wonder that uh, most of the decisions made are around money, right? Um, so I think, you know, the message in the beginning with all of this was um, like, get back to the table and, and get an agreement with physicians. And I think we're still asking for the same thing. It's just, it needs to be one that works. Um, and I think what you guys can demand is not just about healthcare. Like it can be like, what are you doing for rural communities? Because I see them taking from your ambulance services too, right? And, and your parks, <laughs> um, and from, you know, from your parks, from your ambulance services, from all sorts of municipal and putting their hands into municipal affairs too. So I think the big thing is just to to ask for transparency, right? Like, tell us what you're doing so we can hold you accountable because we will tell you when we are not happy with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Samantha, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd like to read out some of the thank yous that are dropping in uh, into the chat. Uh, Ian Hurdle, thank you for sharing since bringing back lots of memories on and of a sore headbutting against government intransigence. Uh, Jim Miller, thank you, Dr. Murr, for an interesting talk and for all your great work you're doing. It is much appreciated. Mark Goodall, I, um, I think we should send all of our MLAs your excellent presentation. Keep on trucking, trucking the best you can. Carol Kiyomi, it just goes on. Um, thank you for your honest and open conversation today. Many thanks to Dr. Murr and her colleagues. Knut Peterson, thank you very much for your heartfelt comments and answers, Dr. Murr. I wish you kindness with rub off on Jason Kenny and the company. And then Laurie Schultz, thank you for presenting on a very difficult experience and giving us the day-to-day -day reality. Please keep on going. And I want to thank you on behalf of SACPA for coming here today and for sharing um, your personal experience as well as such an excellent presentation. Um, before we wrap this up, um, do you have a take home message for us? Please help. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's what I, I said a few times. It's just, I can't say enough. Um, I, the words 
those kind words uh, had me tearing up, par partially in the lack of sleep, but also <laughs> really, really appreciate them. And I think if you can do any, you know, anything, just feed that forward, feed it to your healthcare team locally. Um, that sort of stuff keeps us going, right? Because we're doing it for you. Yeah, back to banging our pots every evening. Hey, please. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we get threats now, right? I know. Um, uh, we, threats instead of of um, thanks, and it's it's hard, right? I know it's minority, but. Yeah. Um, excellent. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you next week, Thursday, with uh, Trevor Page, uh, the UN Food Systems Summit, Summit and the Developing Crisis in Afghanistan, and that is on Thursday at noon. Hope to see you then. Take care, everybody.